1971, I opened the first refuge in the world. And for the first four years, I ran it on the grounds of generational family violence, which needed therapeutic intervention, which I created a model. The difficulty in how it was perceived when I first began to take in mothers and kids was, first of all, the police could do nothing. It was called the domestic. They had no power to intervene behind a closed door. Secondly, as far as the social workers were concerned, they did have, if necessary, uh, an ability to put the women into the local bed and breakfast, but of course that was useless because the man would find her pretty quickly. As far as society was concerned, it was a working class problem. It was a problem that was because uh, frustration, being out of a job or whatever. It had never ever been pointed out that it actually goes across the spectrum. It can be anybody. I remember a social worker saying to me, you don't understand Erin, she knows that he loves her if he hits her. I remember trying not to hit her. I was so appalled, but this was the attitude. Everybody knew, that was the awful thing. It was the unsaid, but everybody knew. Because it was just not ever talked about. I mean, you imagine when I started taking people in, the local vicar called me a marriage wrecker. And I had to physically boot Catholic priests out because they'd come to see their parishioners and were busy telling them they'd made their beds and they should be lying on it. So the attitude was essentially nobody wanted this to surface. Nobody wanted it to, to ever become public. We had volunteers eventually and we have very few staff. But most of it was all done by mums because only they could vote, only they could make decisions. By the way, always, half the staff were always men because we, that was very important for the mothers and kids. I mean, it just grew organically because the word got out locally that there was a place to go. And before long, we were actually in four rooms with an outside loo and a kitchen. We, when we finally moved to a bigger house, there was something like over 40 mothers and children all in that tiny place with the children sleeping on the, on the floors on mattresses and the mothers sleeping with their backs against the wall and their heads on their knees. And we had no money because we were told that the women had perfectly good partners to go back to. The awful part of it all was that having asked Hounslow for help, they immediately took up warrants for my arrest for overcrowding. This went on for all the 12 years I was running the refuge. I was sentenced that if I took any more mothers in over the 36 that was permitted, even though we were already over, I would be jailed and I got back to the refuge. And there was a mum and two kids, so I took her in. And then this lovely, lovely woman in the refuge wrote a letter to the Queen. And within a matter of days, a letter came back and said nobody could be evicted from my refuge. And then they had to make peace. The problem was once the women poured in, there was nowhere to put them. Other boroughs closed down, so they weren't gonna help, including our own. So what we did is we became the biggest squatting agency in England. We took streets of houses, particularly Notting Hill Gate, that were owned by the borough, which they'd done up and left empty. So we, in a way, became a very frightening for the establishment because we were completely anarchic. The most important thing was not to create any form of institution because you don't need staff. Mothers were perfectly capable of running the place themselves and it was important that they did. And I was attacked by feminists regularly. Anywhere I went I was picketed, I was threatened because they believe that all men are potential abusers of women and children and that all women are victims of men's violence. My mother was violent, but both my parents were violent. And I'd always known it to be a generational, intergenerational family problem because I could trace mine back both sides. Both my parents were abused children. And in the creating of this victim role, it's taken away, I find it incredibly patronizing because women are equally as able to be violent, like I was. If you come from a violent home, many people will transcend but some of us, like me, transcend because something intervenes in my life to show me a different way of dealing with pain, anger and frustration. I would go down in front of the pickets and try to explain that there wouldn't be a refuge if I hadn't started it. And why were they making me the enemy? That I blamed them somehow, which isn't the case at all. There are only victims in domestic violence because none of us wanted to be born into violent families. One of the reasons I think it got 
it got hidden is because there was a huge hostility. A woman would come in with a social worker who'd say to me, I can't do anything with her, she keeps going back. And I remember saying to her, well, maybe we're not asking the right questions. And then I began to realize there was a tremendous sense of failure in all those agencies because the majority of violence prone women do go back and back and back until you recognize, as I did, that violence is as toxic and as addictive as alcohol or drugs. And you can get into a violent prone relationship and do things you would never dream that you could do. The whole question of domestic violence, I tried to look for literature, I tried to look for help, where there was absolutely nothing about what happens behind front doors. So that's why I wrote Scream Quietly or the Neighbours Will Hear. And that's the first book in the world on domestic violence. And that's out of print.